Hey guys, Pastor Jurgen here. I'm so glad you're tuning into one of our powerful messages that is guaranteed to absolutely elevate your life to another level. At Awaken, we only want to preach fresh, real, powerful to help you grow stronger in your walk with God, develop your faith so you can take more territory. I'm praying that God blesses you and enriches your soul as you listen to this amazing Word from God. God bless you. I have a word that I want to share with you today. I feel like it's a prophetic word for our church. I've titled this message, A Tale of Two Hearts. How many people have enjoyed reading through the Bible in a year? Yeah, yeah, me too. So it's amazing. And I, I love the Old Testament. I love the stories within it. I particularly love the book of First Samuel because in it we see highlighted the heart postures of two different kings, King Saul and King David. Both of them, if you read their stories, had very similar beginnings. Both of them were the youngest children in their family and, you know, not necessarily... Uh, developed or affirmed or encouraged as children. In fact, the Bible says that when King Saul was anointed king or when they were trying to find him to anoint him, he was hidden under the baggage. He had some insecurity that he was living under. And sadly, we see through the story of his life because he didn't allow God to dislodge him, not just in the natural, but from in, in the metaphorical, in the spiritual from that baggage, he ended up train wrecking his life and actually his children after him. King David was similar in the sense that he also grew up in a family where he was kind of rejected, overlooked. Even when the prophet Samuel came to anoint one of Jesse's sons to be king over Israel, they thought so little of him, they didn't even bring him in. He was out in the back blocks until the prophet Samuel said, hang on a second, I'm seeing all your sons, Jesse, but I'm not feeling it. I'm getting a red light from God. Is, is there anyone else? And they're like, well, actually, there's this little guy out uh, watching the sheep. He's ruddy and good looking, but we kind of like, he's a bit of an outcast, but we'll bring him in and you can kind of see what you feel. And sure enough, that was the one whom the Spirit of the Lord was resting on. Just recently, we had our Awaken conference. And yes, yeah, so it was awesome. Thank you for that woo. And I find after, and, and we had vision builders and how amazing, $10 million pledged to continue to further the work of God in San Diego and, and Salt Lake City. So amazing. In, in moments of great victory and celebration, I don't know whether it's just my personality type, but I find myself becoming very reflective. And... Recently around the globe in some churches, we've seen, uh, we've seen like the dismantling of, of different ministries and different men and women of God who have had, you know, spectacular fails publicly. And so I'm always reflective in moments of great victory and I, and I love to bounce things off my husband. And I said to him, Jürgen, please, Tell me, like, let's avoid the pitfalls of the people that have gone before us and, you know, done these amazing things for God and had great victories, but then lost God in the midst of it and become so obsessed with building their own empire that they stop building the kingdom of God. And I said to him, what, what do you think the difference is? Because a wise person learns from other people's mistakes. I said to him, what do you think the difference is? And he kind of stopped for a second. He was just thinking. He said to me, you know, babe, I really think it's your heart condition. It's the posture of your heart. And when I look at the story of King Saul and King David, it wasn't that David was as pure as the wind-driven snow and never did anything wrong. On the contrary, but it was so clear that the difference in these two men's lives wasn't even so much their behaviour all the time but the condition of their heart. And that really was the beginning of the thought process behind this message, the tale of two hearts. So today I wanna to share with you from a story found in the book of 1 Samuel. I'm gonna start reading in chapter one. I'm gonna read quite a lengthy piece of scripture to really set the scene for you. And then I'm gonna deliver, I believe, what is the word of the Lord to our church right now. 
1 Samuel chapter number 15, starting at verse 1. You all there? Awesome. Samuel the prophet also said to Saul, Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore, heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Oh, wow. It's already awesome. Because there are a lot of voices out there and a lot of words out there. But right now, here's what Samuel is saying to Saul. I want you to heed the voice and the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt, how they took advantage in their vulnerable moment. Now go and attack Amalek. This is God speaking to King Saul and utterly destroy. Somebody say utterly destroy all that they have and do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. In other words, wipe it all out. I want nothing left. So Saul gathered the people together and numbered them into Lam. 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 men of Judah, more than enough to get the job done. And Saul came to a city of Amalek and lay in wait in the valley. Then Saul said to the Kenites, go, depart, get down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed and got out of the hot zone, the danger zone from among the Amalekites. And Saul attacked the Amalekites from Havilah all the way to Shur, which is east of Egypt. He also took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive. Anybody seeing something here that they shouldn't be seeing? What did God say? Utterly destroy. But he took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared, hang on a second, spared, what part of utterly destroyed includes sparing Agag and the best, somebody say the best, of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good and were unwilling to utterly destroy them. So basically everything that looked good, that was pleasurable to the eyes, he didn't destroy. But everything despised and worthless, that they utterly destroyed. Now the word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel because he was a good prophet. He was not just a prophet, but he was a pastor. And it hurt him when the people he loved and anointed disobeyed the Lord. And he cried out to the Lord all night. So when Samuel Samuel rose early in the next morning to meet Saul, it was told Samuel saying, Saul went to Carmel and indeed he set up a monument for himself. So Saul's conscience has been so numbed and pricked and he's been so used to living by himself, he does not even discern he's done anything wrong. He's he's building a monument to himself. And he's gone on around, passed by and gone down to Gilgal. Then Samuel, the prophet, went to Saul and Saul said to him, blessed are you of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Wrong, lies. But Samuel said, well, if you have performed the commandment of the Lord, What then is this bleating of sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? Why is there so much mooing and baying if you did what you were supposed to do? And Saul said, they have bought them from the Amalekites for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, of course. And the rest we have utterly destroyed. Then Samuel said to Saul, be quiet, I like it. And I will tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And Saul said to him, speak on. So Samuel said, when you were little in your own eyes, when you were just a new Christian, were you not head of the tribes of Israel? And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? He gave you influence, he gave you you position, 
You were full of potential. Now then the Lord sent you on a mission and said, go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why then did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, but I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, kind of, and gone on the mission. I went on the mission on which the Lord sent me on. And oh yes, I brought back Agag, king of Amalek, but I have utterly destroyed the other Amalekites. But the people, it's the people, they took of the plunder, the sheep and the oxen, the best of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, they took them to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. So Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. And to heed, to listen, what did Samuel say to Saul at the beginning? Heed the word of the Lord. To heed then the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, He has also rejected you from being king. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. For I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words because I feared the people and I obeyed their voice. Now therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you. For you have rejected the word of the Lord and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. And as Samuel turned around to go away, Saul seized the edge of his robe. Please don't tell me that I don't like hearing that. And then he grabbed it so forcefully that it tore. And then Samuel turned around to him, the prophet Samuel turned around and said, this is a prophetic picture because the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and He has given it to someone, a neighbour of yours, someone who is better than you. Nobody told God that He wasn't supposed to compare people. (laughs) Nobody told God that He wasn't allowed to be non-politically correct. He just went ahead and did it and He just went ahead and said what He meant. And then He goes on and He says, and also, just in case you think that the strength of Israel, Israel's strength is bound up in you, a man, it's not. For the strength of Israel will not lie nor relent. For God is not a man that he should relent. This is a very powerful picture. And I I preached a lot of, I I shared a lot of scripture right there because I wanna deliver to you one point. And that point is this, and I believe that it is a picture of what God is wanting to to bring to not just our church, but the church around the world. I really do believe we're in a time of refinement. Pastor Rachel spoke about it in her announcement, but I really do believe that is the Word of the Lord. And the Word is simply this, obedience is better than sacrifice. See, in this picture, it is very clear that, you know, God anointed Saul to be king. However, at some point, Saul's heart posture shifted And he became all about building his own empire instead of building the kingdom of God. And it's so easy to let your heart turn after a victory. And trust me, Saul had many a mighty military victory. He united the tribes of Israel. In 1 Samuel chapter number 10, we see him have an epic victory against the evil warlord Nahash, saving the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead from having their right eyes poked out. I mean, if you're not reading the Bible, you should start. It's very interesting. He built an army out of thin air. There there was something charismatic about King Saul. He, He was a man who could move the people, unite the people, bring about a great victory. But at some point, his heart turned and it became all about building his own empire instead of building the kingdom. His heart had shifted. 
And right here, the prophet Samuel says to him, God is done with you, Saul. God is done with you. He is tearing the kingdom off you and he's gonna give it to a man who may not be perfect, but he has a heart after God. We're in a season where we've seen the empires of men crumble, but trust me, the kingdom of God is everlasting and God is building His church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So Samuel comes to Saul and he says to him, you've been living in compromise. God asked you to utterly wipe out the Amalekites, to destroy them completely. And it's not because God likes destroying things. It's because He loves His people. And He knew if any part of that Amalek Amalek tribe was to remain, that it would remain at the destruction of the children He loved. He didn't love destruction, but He loves protecting His kids. So the command was very clear. But as we see through the story, King Saul didn't obey it. Instead, the Bible says that he, he was happy to kill everything that was worthless, everything that was despised. Oh, don't want that. That's ugly. That's useless. That has no value. Ah, but look at these oxen. Look at these fatlings. Look at these lambs. I'm smelling a barbecue. That looks mighty fine. Mm, we can have a good old time with these. So he got rid of everything that's worthless, but he kept everything that was pleasing to the eye. And isn't that like us sometimes? We come to God, we give him our heart, but then he gives us a command like he gave King Saul. And he says to us, listen, there's some stuff in your life that I want you to utterly wipe out. Amalek is literally an a picture of our fleshly nature. I want you to surrender that to me. It is not gonna help you, it is gonna hurt you. And if you let any bit of it live, it's gonna be to your demise. And so Saul hears the command and he gets rid of all the stuff that's worthless and it's like us, we come to God and, but then he asks us to kill everything, kill it all. And we're happy to give some stuff away. Oh God, oh God, deal with my shame. Oh, I hate it. It makes me feel so icky, the shame of my regrets and my my past mistakes. I'll I'll give you all that, God. Oh, and God, my broken heart. I I know I keep dating people that you told me not to date and they trash me and they treat me like dirt, but God, my heart's broken. Heal my broken heart, Lord. What about this sickness? I don't want that. Oh, no, 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 no. Don't want any of that sickness. God, you can have my sickness. Have all that. But... What about the meh, meh, and the meh, meh? All those things that give you pleasure. Like that lifestyle that God's like, I want you to, that's enough now. That habit that He's been speaking to you about that He wants you to completely put, oh God, look, I want you to take my shame. I want you to take my broken heart. Take my sickness while you're at it. But I'm gonna keep my porn addiction. I'm gonna keep that, that bitterness and judgment in my heart because it helps me lord it over other people. I, I mean, God, I'm gonna give you, yep, sickness, shame, all those kinds of things, but, but I'm still gonna get drunk every weekend. I'm not gonna change my lifestyle. I'll give you all the stuff I don't want, everything that's useless, everything that's worthless, everything I despise, ew, Have it, Lord. But this stuff, this brings me pleasure. I'm keeping that. And then when the prophet Samuel confronts King Saul on his compromise, you know what his answer is? Oh, I'm sorry, all right? Sorry, please pardon me now. And let's just go offer a sacrifice. And the prophet Samuel has to say to him, Saul, you don't get it. God doesn't want your sacrifice. He's sick of seeing you turn up time and time again, having to burn a poor old bull or a ram on a fire because you just won't do what you're freaking told. And we might say, well, I'd never do that. But do we? We'll kill all that. Didn't want it anyway. But God, I'm keeping this. 
And then when somebody points it out, I'll just say, oh, whoa, well, we'll, do, we'll have an altar call next Sunday. I'll be the first one out there. And we roll up to church on a Sunday and we slide down to the altar call. Thank you, Jesus. Erase, 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 erase. And then back to the And we end up looking just like the people that we've been commissioned to go out in the whole world and make disciples. Where's our witness? Oh, the difference between you and me is I just go on an altar call every Sunday and I get my Hail Mary and out the door I go. Back to sinning. Back to eating my rams, eating my sheep, eating my bulls. And then I'll just wipe my greasy face. Get on that altar call and then get back to those same hijinks and nonsense. You're abusing the grace of God is what the prophet Samuel is saying to Saul, oh, well, that's not, we haven't heard that preaching for a while. Well, we need to, we need to. Because what's the difference between the world and us? We're doing the same things, living the same lifestyles. They're getting drunk on weekends, we're getting drunk on weekends. They're cheating on their spouse, we're cheating on our spouse. They're stealing from work, we're stealing from work. We're trash talking people, they're trash talking people. They're wearing those bikinis that show off your entire butt. We're wearing the bikinis that show off your... I mean, the amount of butts, good Lord. Even if I had a butt worth showing off, I still wouldn't. It's beneath you. Come on, America, cover your butt. Cover your butt. I was at the beach the other day. This teenage girl walked past on a skateboard but had to turn around to get past me. I was assaulted with two butt cheeks. I'm like, why, why? But look, I get sure the world's gonna show their butts off. Well, we don't need to do it. I'm not talking about being prudy and we're not the church that says no bikinis and no spaghetti straps. No, but what I'm telling you is where's your heart? Why, why do you wanna show the world your butt if you're a Christian? Stop, put your butt away. Well, we're not a legalistic church and so we drink. Yeah, but are you abusing it? Do you enjoy it or does it it enjoy making a fool out of you? Obedience is better than sacrifice. What am I saying? I'm saying live in such a way where you desire to please God. Will God forgive you? Yes, the Bible says when you cry out to God and humble yourself and repent, of course His forgiveness is there. But, but I wonder if we could get to the stage where our heart is actually at a point where like God, I don't wanna live from apology to apology anymore, from sacrifice to sacrifice anymore, having a trot on down to an altar call every Sunday, but my life is evidence of a changed heart. <laughs> Here's how Jesus said it. If you love me, keep my commands. And I think we seem to have lost that a little bit as a church community around the globe. In our desire to win everybody, we have allowed a spirit of compromise to come in. And it's not that, it's not that sin won't happen. I, I wanna highlight a difference between King Saul and King David. Both of them were sinners. One thought they could just rock onto an altar call every week and then go back to living their life. David, however, when he repented after he sinned, he meant it. He changed his ways. The difference between King Saul and King David is this. When King Saul was confronted by the priest Ahimelech, he had Ahimelech and 80 other priests put to death. And you might say, well, I would never do that. But do we? Do we live in such a way when the people that God has anointed in our world to come and bring us correction about how we're living in compromise? Or we've turned what should be the kingdom of God into our own personal empire? When they come and bring a word of correction, do we put them to death by saying, well, I'm leaving. 
I'm going to the church down the road that will pander to my sin of choice. That will allow me to walk into church with all my oxen and all my fatlings and all my lambs. And there's churches around America that have made entire movements out of pandering to your fatlings, your lambs and your oxen. But I gotta ask the question then, does God really have your heart? And, and I'm speaking as a prophet of the Lord today. If you keep living that way, in, out, in, out, out to go, out to go, out to go, out to go. Mm, 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 mm. Are you even saved? Did you even give God your heart? Did you give it to Him? Because the evidence of giving God your heart is a changed life. David was different, why? Nathan the prophet came to him and if you were to put King Saul's sins on a page and King David's, King David was badder on paper. What's the difference? When Nathan the prophet came to David, he didn't say, off with your head like King Saul did. I'm going to another church and I will be writing a negative Yelp review. There's a church down the road that will let me be who I am. All right. Nathan came to David and said to him, you've sinned. He told a story about a family whose one and only little lamb was taken and slaughtered by a king to feast at his table while that family suffered the loss of their little lamb and David was livid. Who could do such a thing? And Nathan turned to him and pointed his very prophetic finger in his face and said, you are that man. You took this family's one little lamb. You slaughtered it and you feasted on it. Instead of saying to Nathan, off with your head, how dare you? I am the king, you cannot confront me. And that's the truth, isn't it? We're all kings in our own world. When someone comes to tell you something you don't wanna hear, do you just say off with your head? I don't wanna hear that. And I'm leaving the church and I'm leaving you and I'm killing the voice of the priest in my life. Instead, King David took it. He took his licks. He wrote a Psalm, Psalm 51. Create in me a clean heart. What did he say? Oh God, my heart has drifted from you. And many of us in our lifetimes, yes, we may give God our heart, but I've found that oftentimes your heart has legs. And we put it on the altar of sacrifice. And I'm not saying you didn't mean it when you gave the Lord your heart for the first time, but has it grown legs and walked off? And have you got it again? It's time to give it back. And King Saul, he wrote that Psalm, Psalm 51, create in me a clean heart, oh God, and renew a steadfast, right spirit within me. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. See, David in that Psalm realised I've taken my heart back and I've forgotten the privilege of what it means to be a disciple of God, a, a child of God, to be saved, I forgot. Oh God, create in me a clean heart and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation and renew a steadfast spirit within me. The difference was not even so much the transgression as much as it was the genuine heart of repentance. When we were in Italy recently, Pastor Jürgen and I, we got to have a tour of the Vatican and we also had a tour of St. Peter's Basilica and it was very, very interesting some of the things we saw. And I believe that, you know, some of the things that were represented there are things that God is wanting to address and dismantle in His church. So we, we came across this door, it was called the Holy Door. And of course, the minute they said, this is the Holy Door, I wanna know why. Why do we need a Holy Door? And if you can go ahead and put that, that picture up of the Holy Door. Here's the Holy Door, guarded. So the legend behind this door is once every 50 years, it is opened, it's cemented shut, but once every 50 years it will get opened and whoever walks through it, all their sins will be forgiven. It's a super door. 
Interesting though, because Jesus is the door that we come to through whom all our sins are forgiven. But right here, but, but not these guys, they need a holy door. But the interesting thing about this is not so much the holy door or the forgiveness of sins. It's what happens before the door is opened. So the tour guide said to us, you know, it's a crazy thing. Three days before the door is opened, every 50 years on Jubilee and people walk on through and get their sins forgiven, three days before they have in the city square the biggest orgy, the most perverse Mardi Gras, three days of absolute perversion. Because they think, well, then we just walk through the door. So we're ns, 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 oh. <laughs> And my question is, what does the condition of your heart got to look like? That you see grace or an opportunity for forgiveness as an opportunity to sin and indulge the worst possible parts of your flesh, man. I wonder if we what it would look like if we lived differently. If instead of giving God our traditions, I'm just turning up on Sunday and I'll jump on the altar call, but I don't really mean it because I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna do everything that I did last week, but then I'll just come again on Sunday. And it's a cycle and it's a cycle and it's a cycle and it's a cycle. I wonder how things would change if we truly surrendered our hearts to God. I wonder what our witness would look like. You know, we have a generation in many churches that have so been indoctrinated with a false misrepresentation of what the grace of God looks like that they've never even had a chance to surrender their hearts to God. They've been taught that Jesus is just your non-judgmental friend. He doesn't care how you live. Well, of course He cares because He cares about you. I wonder if we could raise a generation of disciples who care less about fulfilling their own fleshly desires and more about living a life that brings pleasure to God. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Living a life where others look at it and go, wow, oh my gosh, you've so inspired me. Look at your life. I saw who you were and now who you are. My gosh, what a testimony. Or are we just doing the same things that the rest of the world is doing, but just wearing a WWJD bracelet or an Awaken t-shirt? I did all that stuff, but there's an Awaken logo on it, so it makes it okay. Don't make it okay. Give Jesus your heart. Just a couple of decisions Saul Saul shows us from coming to a place in the kingdom where God gives you influence and elevation and we're all just a couple of decisions away of turning Sunday into just a religious ritual. Put in tithe, come forward on altar call, receive forgiveness, go back and do everything we did the week before with no change. I think that God is calling His church into a place of refinement because He wants something really precious that belongs to you, your heart. God wants your entire heart. He wants every part of you. And let me tell you, the greatest thing I ever did was give God my entire heart. The greatest thing I ever did, my life could never have been or isn't, could never be what it is unless I had surrendered my entire heart to God. Too many Christians playing in the shallows, thinking that on a Sunday we can just come in and do the divine mea culpa, fall at our feet on the altar call and then just go back living to how we were living. Well, this passage of Scripture in the Old Testament, God speaks very clearly to Saul and says, I am done with you. I can't have you as representation of my kingdom anymore because look at your heart. He didn't even say look at your behaviour because his behaviour was an indicator of his heart. I 
I'd love it if everybody would just close their eyes right now. This message is for each person to ponder individually. God, is there a part of me that is hanging on to things that you've actually asked me to kill? And I've made myself king instead of you king. And it's easy after a conference like Awaken where we had some victories and people were moved with emotion and there were great God encounters that we had. To let that emotion just be a moment instead of lead you to a place of transformation. Let emotion, the emotion of a moment, emotion isn't a bad thing, but it is unless it leads you to a place of devotion. When you had those God encounters and you felt it and you cried and God spoke to you, did it lead to devotion? Did it lead to change? Saul made a lot of emotional speeches in his life, but it never led to change. It was just words. King David was emotional too, but his emotion led him to a place of greater devotion. Saul had to leave a monument to himself because he had no disciples. He didn't inspire anybody to live better. King David, however, never built a monument to himself, but he left a legacy. The Bible spoke of him right throughout the Old Testament and into the New. Many kings that didn't even know him said of, said of themselves, and I walked in the statutes or the ways of my father, David. People ask us sometimes, why, Pastor Leanne, do we have to have 16 campuses? Why 16 campuses? Why can't we just have one big mega campus? And Pastor Jürgen preaches every week. You know why? Because we're not building a monument to ourselves, a monument to men like Saul did, build a monument to himself. We are building a legacy of sons and daughters who are filled with the Spirit of God, who have the right heart. So right now I want you to do what King David did in Psalm 139. Oh God, search me, know me, test my every anxious thought and see that there be no wicked way within me and lead me in the way everlasting. We're not called to leave a monument to ourselves like King Saul did, but a legacy that speaks long before we're gone. I have a confession to make. Pastor Jürgen and I are both terminal. We are a man and a woman with a term. When we're very, very, very old, after preaching at church on a Sunday, we're gonna go to a beach in Del Mar with an Aperol spritz, and then we're going to die together as very old people. So we can't build a church that is based around us because then the church too will be terminal. We need to build it on the Kingdom, not a memorial stone left. And here is our one mega campus with stained glass window pictures of Pastor Jürgen and Leanne, no. <laughs> but rather our commission is to raise disciples, sons and daughters of God, <laughs> who after us, carry the Spirit of God, have a heart after God, men and women after God, God's own heart. I've had people say to me, well, well, who are you gonna pass the baton on to, Pastor Jürgen and Leanne? What do you mean baton, singular? What do you mean one sweaty baton? We're not gonna pass on a baton. We're gonna pass on spirit, a heart after God, to sons and daughters, to your sons and daughters and to their sons and daughters, so long after our name has been forgotten, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is the only one who's given glory. You know, there's a Scripture in the book of Revelation that talks about the 24 elders surrounding the, the throne. And when these elders get to eternity, the Bible says that they take off their crowns and they cast them at the throne of God. And, and I wonder if that's because they realise the futility of their human crowns. The best thing this world could offer you is a crown that erodes. Don't ser search or seek for a crown that man wants to put on your head when God has one for you in heaven. 
Don't live for status and memorial today. Live instead to leave a legacy that speaks long after your life is gone as a man or woman after God's own heart. Can somebody give God a huge shout of praise this morning? A huge shout of praise. What God has begun does not need to end if we become men and women who give our entire hearts to God, not living through the motions of Christianity or Christian tradition where we come forward, we do this and we do that, but our heart is not in it. God wants your heart today and it's our hearts that change the world. It is a heart posture that we leave and deposit in the men and women and the sons and daughters after us that changes lives for eternity. Right now, I'd, I'd like to just ask you a question. I'd like to ask you a question today. If you're here and you realise, wow, I need to give my heart fully and completely to the Lord. I have held a part of my life back. I want you to just come forward so I can pray with you. I'd love you to come forward. If that's you and you're like, my gosh, yes, I wanna give God my entire heart. I want you to run to the front. Come on, beautiful. I know there's more people today. Don't be shy as you come. God's doing amazing things in heart. So proud of you, Dr. Leo. So proud of you, so proud of you. Keep coming, guys. Beautiful, man, I love it. This is awesome. This is how the world has changed. Give God your whole heart, give Him your whole life. Look, I know I'm, I'm not gonna linger too long in this, but I know there are many people that need to be down here. And it's not some admittance of some grave error, but really just, God, I wanna give you my entire life. Maybe you've never done it before. Maybe you've come to church and you've sat in church, but you've never actually responded to God in this way and it's time to do that. If that's you, just run to the front. I'd love it if everybody would stand. And those of you that need to respond, come down here so we can pray. Beautiful, awesome. I love it. Obedience is better than sacrifice. I'm proud of you guys. You know, in all my years as a pastor, I have seen people who have responded to this kind of word and have come down on the altar call and meant it. My gosh, everything shifts. And I'm so proud of you for your humility and for your devotion to God. We're gonna pray right now. There's a few more people coming. Just run to the front. Stretch out your hands to these ones. Beautiful, awesome, awesome. Praise God, so proud of you guys, so awesome. Stretch out your hands. Father, I thank You for these ones who responded. Father, I thank You before me stands men who have a heart after You, men with a heart like King David had. Father, we come to You today and we say, Lord, that we repent from living lives in compromise. Father, for not surrendering to You the things that You called us to surrender. God, I thank You right now for the devotion and the vow made in this moment. We will not treat, Father, Your Kingdom, Your call, Your love or Your grace lightly. We surrender everything to You this day. In Jesus' mighty Name, Amen, Amen. God bless you guys. Dr. Leo, I just wanna say over your life, I, I saw like the turning of cogs in your heart, things that have been seized, like starting up again and just that oil. There is something powerful when you make a stand like that for Christ, for Christ, when you make a stand for Jesus and lift your hands and walk forward in humility, something shifts. The Bible says that God gives grace to the humble. And I just see a double portion of God's grace coming into your world. God's grace is sufficient for you. And I just see those cogs starting it, things that were seized coming back to life. Things that were seized coming back to life. Yeah, I just see God's hand also upon your children. And the decisions that you've made as an adult man are greatly gonna be reflecting in your children after you. Just, just some amazing things. Never underestimate coming forward with a contrite heart to the altar. Never, God sees. And it may be the hardest thing in the world to do, but God sees it. And what we do, my gosh, He honours it and things start to amplify and multiply in our life. And I see that over your life as well. We've not met before, what's your name? Brian, yeah, Brian. Yeah, great to meet you, Ryan. 
Yeah, really, really proud of you. We need more brave men in our world, not less. But I'm proud of your courage and your bravery. You know, the hardest thing to do can be to step forward on an altar call with, with a contrite heart. Like it can be one of the, the hardest things in the world to do, especially when there's not a ton of people out here. But I just see just as you've taken that bold step for God, God is gonna take a bold leap yes. for you. A bold, if you seek me, you will find me, the Bible says. And if we draw near to God, He draws near to us. And I just see the presence of God gonna come so strongly into your world, particularly in an area where you've had a struggle and a battle. And it's like because you've invited God in that your strength combined with His strength, your obedience combined with His strength is gonna bring a great transformation into an area of your life where you've had some struggle. So I just see that God's with you. God's really proud of you and God loves you. He really loves you, Ryan. God bless you. God bless you. Amen, amen. Wow, what an amazing word. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Hey, listen, for more information about our church, go to www.awakenchurch.com or subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't already and download our app. It is amazing. It is chock full of incredible messages, information about upcoming events, and you can even support our ministry if you feel so inclined. We loved having you with us today. We look forward to seeing you again. God bless you. Live a life that is transformative. Bye for now.